Hey everyone, I'm Kel, Red Zone MTG, and today I have another Commander Deck Tech for you. Today's video is actually one of my most requested videos ever since I did a mail day picking up this commander a little while back. And that commander, of course, is Send Triplets, as you can see here. This is one of my favorite decks. It is one of my pet decks. I basically have four pet decks. I think I have around 11 commander decks total, but I have four pet decks that I like to pimp out and I like to spend a lot of time working on. I guess you can call them like my four horsemen or something like that. I don't know. In any case, this is definitely the most controlling of the decks and it's probably the most controlling deck I've ever featured on this channel. And yeah, let's just start talking about it. So the commander is Sen Triplets, the Daughters of Esper. Basically a classic commander card. They are a 3-3 legendary artifact creature, human wizard for two of any and then Esper colors, white, blue, and black. And they say, at the beginning of your upkeep, choose target opponent. This turn, that player can't play spells or activated abilities and plays with his or her hand revealed. You can play cards from that player's hand this turn. So basically on your turn, you get to pick someone and you're like, hey, you can't do anything and I could do all of your things. So this deck runs a lot of controlling things because we want to take advantage of, you know, stealing our opponent's stuff, you know, taking control of our opponent's abilities during our turn. That also means we have a lot of sources that add mana of any color, so we can actually cast their spells. And this deck really focuses on stealing our opponent's stuff or, or taking control of our opponent's stuff. We don't have a ton of win conditions ourselves. We do have some really, really spicy ones. I'll talk about those when the time comes. Let's start talking about uh, the rest of the deck. All right, so before we start talking about the meat and potatoes of the deck, I want to mention two of uh, what I would consider our lieutenants of the deck. They're basically really powerful creatures that don't really fit in the theme, but they're just so good and so cool and some of my favorite characters of all time that I just put them in here and um, they're, I mean they're just they're just very very powerful first up is Elish Norn Grand Cenobite she's a 4-7 legendary creature Praetor for five of any double white with vigilance other creatures you control get plus two plus two and creatures your opponents control get minus two minus two like I said we don't have a whole lot of win conditions ourselves but this definitely helps kill our opponent stuff and whatever we steal from them either through their deck or through any other nefarious means it'll pop them up so yeah, Elishnorn is fantastic. And then also we have Avacyn, Angel of Hope. This card is amazing. It is a eight drop, five of any, triple white, eight, eight, flying, vigilance, indestructible. Other permanents you control have indestructible. So basically everything that we steal or everything that we copy or play or even our own stuff, you know, if we got our Elishnorn out here, all of our stuff has indestructible. Basically just protects our board and um, yeah, not much else to say. It's Avacyn. Next, we have some cards that synergize with the deck. Well, not really. They're, they're more like cards that fit with the theme of the deck, and we'll cover them individually. So first of all, we have the Vesuvan Doppelganger. This is one of my favorite cards of all time. Probably tied for my favorite card. Man, I love this card. I love Quentin Hoover's artwork. It is just fantastic. Anyway, let's keep going. This is a five drop. She, it is a star star. And I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but basically when it comes into play, it clones a creature, so you can choose a creature and it becomes a copy of that creature. And then at the beginning of your upkeep, you get to choose a new creature and then it becomes a copy of that creature. So every single turn, it becomes a copy of a different creature. So yeah, comes into play, clone a creature, and then every single one of your upkeeps, choose a different creature and it becomes a copy of that creature. This card is super, super sweet. Next we have Mnemonic Betrayal. Johnny Mnemonic Betrayal, as I always call this card. It is a three drop sorcery, one of any blue and a black. And this is basically Yogg Will or Yogmoth's Will, but you do it to your opponents instead of to yourself. So it says, exile all cards from all opponents graveyards. You may cast those cards this turn. You may spend mana as though it were mana of any type to cast those spells. At the beginning of the next end step, if any of those cards remain exiled, return them to their owner's graveyards. Exile Mnemonic Betrayal. So like I said, it's kind of like a reverse Yogg Will. You get to cast stuff from your opponent's graveyards, which is really, really sweet. Our Send Triplets lets us cast stuff from their hands, and this card lets us cast them from their graveyard. I kind of said that weird, but yes, cast from their graveyard. Really sweet. Next, we have Praetor's Grasp. This is a three-drop sorcery, one of any double black. You get to search target opponent's library for a card, and then exile it face down. Then that player shuffles his or her library. You may look at it and play that card for as long as it remains exiled. Super, super sweet. And we do have a lot of ways to add mana of any color. So we can pick, you know, a red spell and then still be able to play that. Also, this card is fantastic for destroying your opponent's combo. You know, search their deck for their one combo piece for their lab maniac or whatever. And then we get it and they'll never get it back, which is 
Very, very cool. Or you can just get a land. You can go get their Maze of Ith. Go get their, uh, I don't know, Gaia's Cradle or whatever else they have. I like this card quite a bit, and I think it really, really fits in with the themes of this deck. Similarly, we have Mind's Dilation, one of my favorite enchantments. It is a 7-drop, 5 of any, double blue. Whenever an opponent casts his or her first spell each turn, that player exiles the top card of his or her library. If it's a non-land card, you may cast it without paying its mana cost. Super, super sweet. So every single one of your opponent's turns, if they cast a spell, you get one of their cards. If they cast a spell on your turn, you get one of their cards. This card is super, super sweet. It's crazy value, especially since you get to play them like for free. Yeah, free stuff, always really cool. Next up, we have As Foretold and a couple other cards that really help us cast spells using Send Triplet's ability. So I'll go over these individually, but that's basically what they do. So As Foretold is an enchantment, two of any and a blue. At the beginning of your upkeep, put a time counter on As Foretold. Once each turn, so you can do this on your opponent's turn too, you may pay zero rather than pay the mana cost for a spell you cast with converted mana cost X or less where X is the number of time counters on As Foretold. And yes, this does work with Send Triplets. Send Triplets lets us cast spells from our opponent's hand. And this basically just says you may pay zero rather than pay the mana cost for a spell you cast. It's not spell you cast from your hand or spell you cast from your graveyard or anything. It just says a spell you cast. So you can, you know, use As Foretold and Send Triplets to cast spells from our opponent's hand for free, you know, assuming it has the appropriate number of time counters and everything. I think As Foretold is a, you know, staple in any Sand Triplets deck. Next, we have Celestial Dawn and Mycosynth Lattice. And basically what these do is they let us tap mana for mana of any color. I mean, I can go into them deeply, but um, I'm not really going to. It's going to take a long time because they have a lot of weird rules interaction. But Celestial Dawn basically makes everything white. It makes all non-land cards you own not in play white. It makes all non-land permanents you control white. All lands you control are planes. All colored mana symbols in mana costs of these cards and permanents are white. So it just makes everything white and it makes all the stuff you add white. So you basically can just play your opponent's spells because everything's white. It's actually a classic, classic Send Triplets card. And then finally we have Mycosynth Lattice. This card has shot up quite a bit since I added it into this deck. It's basically because of Karn the Great Creator, which I do not run in this deck. I'm not running that combo. I do run some combos in this deck, and we'll talk about those a little bit later, but uh, we're not running the Karn Mycosynth Lattice combo. They're a little, it's a little unfun, you know? I mean, the combos that we have insta-win, but uh, at least we don't like, you know, drag the game out for a million turns while everyone's just miserable and unable to play. Basically what this does is very similar to Celestial Dawn, honestly, except it turns everything into artifacts, makes everything colorless, and then players can spend mana as though it were mana of any color. So, you know, that lets us play spells from our opponent's hands with Send Triplets. Like I said, lots and lots of synergy here, at least with these three cards. Next up, before we get to our controlly bits of the deck, we're going to talk about some of our combos and some of our ways to get the combos. So first up is the tutors. We got Demonic Tutor, you know. It's Demonic Tutor. I bought a bunch of these ones with this uh, Liliana artwork because it is my favorite Demonic Tutor artwork. I mean, it's Demonic Tutor. Run it if you got it. Next up, we have Mystical Tutor and Enlightened Tutor. And these kind of do the same thing. The Mystical Tutor lets you search your deck for an instant or sorcery card. I know it says Interrupt and Mana Source. Those are basically instants these days. You put the card on top of your deck, while Enlightened Tutor lets you search your deck for an artifact or enchantment, and then you put it on top of your deck. Of course, you have to shuffle the decks before you put the card on top. They are card disadvantaged. They're not quite as effective as Demonic Tutor because you put the card on top of your deck instead of into your hand, but they're still really, really good at fishing up whatever you need to get. Next, we have Spell Seeker. I love this card. It is a 1-1 Human Wizard for two of any and a blue. When Spell Seeker enters the battlefield, you may search your library for an instant or sorcery card with converted mana cost two or less. Reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. You can get a Demonic Tutor if you really need something else. Or you can get, you know, Cyclonic Rift, Mana Drain. There's a lot of really sweet uh, instant and or sorceries in this deck. And Spellseeker can always get something pretty, pretty sweet. And then finally, this is Fabricate. This is a three drop. It is a sorcery, two of any and a blue. And it just says, search your library for an artifact card. Put it into your hand, then shuffle your library. And why do we want to search our deck for all of this kind of stuff? Well, let me show you the combos we have. So my Send Triplets deck runs two infinite combos. And basically I do this because, you know, it's a control deck. 
we really need a way to close out the game. Our game plan is to actually steal our opponent's stuff and kill them all with their own stuff, but sometimes that doesn't happen and you get like three hour matches and we don't want three hour matches. We want a way to end the game. This combo is Micaeus the Unhollowed and Triskelion. This is a classic insta-win combo and I can go over it really quickly. So Triskelion is a six mana artifact creature. It is a one one. It comes into play with three plus one plus one counters, and then you can remove a plus one plus one counter and deal one damage to any target. Micaeus the Unhollowed, he's a five five zombie cleric for three of any triple black. It has Intimidate, that doesn't really matter. Whenever a human deals damage to you, destroy it. That also doesn't really matter. What really matters, it says, other non-human creatures you control get plus one plus one and have Undying. And what Undying is, it says, when a creature with Undying dies, if it had no plus one plus one counters on it, return it to the battlefield under its owner's control with a plus one plus one counter on it. So you can kind of see where we're going here. So how this combo works is Triskelion with Micaeus is a 2-2 two, two, because it gets plus one plus one from Micaeus' ability. It also has Undying and also has three plus one plus one counters. So we remove one counter to deal one damage to whatever we want and remove the other two counters to deal damage to Triskelion, killing it. And when it dies, you know, it has Undying, so it comes back into play with an additional plus one plus one counter and then all of the other three plus one plus one counters that it comes into play with. And uh, basically every single cycle beyond the first, it's two damage divided as we choose, comes back into play, Two damage, comes back into play, two damage, that's infinite combos, we can do that infinite times, two damage, kill everyone's creatures, or just, you know, kill our opponents. This is a classic combo, and you see this in a lot of decks, and the fact that Triskelion is an artifact is really good for cards like, you know, Fabricate or Enlighten Tutor, so they, you know, make it so we can search them up a lot easier. The other infinite combo we run is Rest in Peace and Helm of Obedience. This is kind of a, a weird combo, but I'll go over it. And basically what it does is it will kill one opponent every single time we activate the Helm of Obedience. Whereas like the Triskelion Micaeus combo can just kill everyone on the spot. This one only kills one person at a time. Also note that this is an enchantment and an artifact. So both really, really good to search up for with uh, Fabricate and Enlighten Tutor. So rest in peace says, when Rest in Peace enters the battlefield, exile all cards from all graveyards, which is actually pretty good. Also, it's an enchantment for one of any and a white. I guess I should note that. If a card or token would be put into a graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. That's really, really key. When it would be put into the graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead of putting it into the graveyard. And so what Helm of Obedience does, it's an artifact for four. It says X tap. Put the top card of target opponent's library into his or her graveyard. Continue doing this until you have put X cards or a creature into that graveyard, whichever comes first. If the last card put into the graveyard is a creature card, bury the helm and put that creature into play under your control as though it were just cast X cannot equal zero. So what we do is we make X equal one and then you put the top card of your opponent's deck into their graveyard, except rest in peace says it can't go in the graveyard. It's exiled. And so you have to take the next card and put it in the graveyard, except you can't, it's exiled. So when you activate the Helm of Obedience, it has to be for one, cannot equal zero, uh, you deck an opponent. And like I said, you can only do that one at a time unless you have a way to untap Helm of Obedience, but it's still a pretty good combo. And I really like this one over some other infinite combos because Rest in Peace is actually just really good on its own. And we don't really have a whole lot of graveyard shenanigans in the deck, there's a couple. You know, there's a couple non-bows with this, like Mnemonic Betrayal and stuff like that, but I still think it's really good and it's really easy to search up. All right, let's get to our controlling stuff, starting off with our prison cards. First up is Grand Abolisher. It is a 2-2 human cleric for a double white. During your turn, your opponents can't cast spells or activate abilities of artifacts, creatures, or enchantments. So Send Triplets already says that we get to pick one player during our upkeep and they can't do that stuff anyway, but Grand Abolisher basically makes it so our other opponents can't mess with us either. Very similar to that, we have Teferi Time Raveler. So this is a legendary Planeswalker Teferi for one of any, a white and a blue. Each opponent can cast spells only any time they could cast a sorcery. So basically they can't cast spells on your turn. Once again, very, very similar to Send Triplets and Grand Abolisher. We want to lock our opponents down so they can't do stuff on our turn. They can do stuff on their own turn. Sure, we let them do their things. But on our turn, no, that, that's our turn. That is our time to do stuff. And you know, sometimes it's our time to do their stuff on our turn. He also has a couple other abilities. Plus one, until your next turn, you may cast sorcery spells as though they had flash. Pretty sweet. We don't have a whole lot of sorceries in the deck, so it's not that relevant. 
Minus three is pretty good. Return up to one target artifact, creature, or enchantment to its owner's hand. Then we get a draw card. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. Teferi is really good in this deck. Next is Fate Spinner. This is a three drop, one of any double blue. It is a one, two. It is a human wizard, and I got my uh, I got my gatherer out, as you can see here, because I don't remember exactly what this does. It's a really sweet card, but it's a little complicated. It says, at the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, that player chooses draw step, main phase, or combat phase. The player skips each instant of the chosen step or phase this turn. And that's at the beginning of each opponent's upkeep. So they have to either skip their draw, skip playing anything, you know, like main phase stuff, or skip their combat. Most times people skip combat. If they're skipping combat, that basically means they're not attacking you, which is, you know, pretty, pretty good. And if they're not attacking you, they might be trying to do other things, but we can deal with those other things. I like Fate Spinner quite a bit. I think it's a really sweet card with a pretty sweet art by RK Post. Next, we have Propaganda and Ghostly Prison. These are, you know, prison cards. <laughs> Ghostly Prison is a prison card. They both do the exact same thing. They are enchantments for three. This one is two of any and a white. Propaganda is two of any and a blue. And they both say creatures can't attack you unless their controller pays two for each creature he or she controls that attacks you. Yeah, really, really good. If they're gonna attack us, we're gonna make them pay for it. Next up, we have the Control Player's Dream with a giant stack of powerful counter spells. And we're gonna go over these pretty quick because they're pretty iconic counter spells. We have Mana Drain. It's the best counter spell ever printed. Double blue, counter spell, and then you get X mana where X is the converted mana cost of the spell that you countered on our next main phase. Super, super sweet. I mean, it's Mana Drain. Next up we have counter spell. Double blue, counter target spell. I got like the, like the bubbly art. I like the classic art, but I also like the bubbly art. Next up is Arcane Denial, and I think this card is particularly good in this deck. It says, counter target spell, its controller may draw up to two cards at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. You draw a card at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. So, why do we want our opponent to draw two cards? I mean, this seems like card parity, right? We counter their thing, and we spend a card, but we also get to draw a card, and they lose their thing that they just played, but they get to draw two cards, so it's kind of even. However... We kind of want them to draw cards, especially at the beginning of the next turn's upkeep. So if we counter a spell on their turn, you know, say they cast a creature or something, and then we, we counter it with Arcane Denial, and then it's our turn, they get to draw two cards, but we just choose them for send triplets, they can't play anything, and then we get to play whatever they just drew with Arcane Denial. Yeah, I think this card is really, really good in send triplets. Next is Dovin's Veto. This spell can't be countered. Counter target non-creature spell, so it's a negate that your opponents can't mess with. Yep. Put it in your deck, it's really good. Next is Render Silent, I really like this one. This is double blue and a white counter target spell. It's controller, can't cast spells this turn. Yeah, you doing something annoying? Get countered. You can't do anything. Well, you can attack us maybe if you want, but uh, you know, you already skipped your attack with Fate Spinner, so you can't do anything. <laughs> I mean, that might be Magical Christmas Land, but I think it's really sweet and it, it goes really well in the deck. Next up is Force of Negation. I am not running Force of Will in this deck because I don't have an extra copy of Force of Will to run in this deck, but Force of Negation does a pretty good job of that. It is a one of any double blue instant. If it's not your turn, you may exile a blue card from your hand rather than pay this spell's mana cost. Counter target non-creature spell. If that spell is countered this way, exile it instead of putting it into his owner's graveyard. Yeah, just being able to counter our opponent's stuff, you know, right when we need to. If we're all tapped out, they think we're vulnerable. We can Force of Negation, their big spell, their Genesis Wave, or their, I don't know, in Garrick's Wake. I don't know why, that's the only thing I can think of. But yeah, Force of Negation is sweet. Disallow is also very, very sweet. For one of any double blue counter target spell, activate ability, or triggered ability. Really, really versatile. And, and quite, quite good. Next up is Desertion. Counter target spell, if that spell is an artifact or summon spell, so if it's an artifact or creature, Put it into play under your control as though it were just played for three of any and double blue. So it's kind of expensive as a counter spell, but if it's a creature or artifact, we get it. And that is super sweet. I mean, I love countering their Eldrazi and then just getting it. Ooh, that's so good. Next is Archmage's Charm. And the next couple ones, these ones are going to be cards that kind of have dual purpose, except for Vencer here, but we'll, we'll talk about him in a minute. So Archmage's Charm, triple blue, choose one, counter target spell. Yeah, pretty good. Target player draws two cards. Yeah, also pretty good. Or gain control of target non-land permanent with converted mana cost one or less. So, you know, like a soul ring or something. Yeah, also pretty good. Three pretty good things added up. 
you know, we can only choose one, but this it's so versatile. I think this card is is excellent. I think it's good in any any control deck or any blue deck if you're running a lot of blue. Next is Supreme Will, one of my pet cards. This is a three drop, two of any blue, choose one, counter target spell unless this controller pays three. Or we're gonna look at the top four cards of our library, put one of them into our hand, and the rest go on the bottom of the library in any order. So yeah, card selection or counter spell. Yeah, pretty, pretty good. Next is very similar, Cryptic Command. It's got like a little, little, little dot thing at the top. Cryptic Command, instant. One of any triple blue, choose two. Counter target spell, bounce it permanent. Tap all creatures your opponents control or draw a card. I mean, it's Cryptic Command. It is an iconic card. Super good. Put it in all of your blue decks if you can handle the triple blue. Next is Mystic Confluence, just like Cryptic Command. Except we get to choose three. You also may choose the mode more than once. So counter target spell, unless it's control, it pays three. Return target creature to its owner's hand or draw a card. So yeah, we can draw three cards or really counter a spell or counter a spell, bounce a dude and draw a card. I mean, Mystic Confluence is also excellent. And then finally, we have Venser Shaper Savant, and he's kind of a removal spell, kind of a counter spell. He is a legendary creature, human wizard, 2-2 two, two, for two of any double blue. He has flash, and when he enters the battlefield, return target spell or permanent to its owner's hand. And it says target spell, so you can bounce a spell on the stack, which is pretty sweet. I love Venser. I think he's a really sweet card, and we have a way to keep getting him back. You know, we have a land in our deck that lets us return wizards back to our hand. And we have some wizards that we really want to get back to our hand. So we'll talk about that in the land section. But uh, yeah, keep that in mind. Venser, super sweet. Next up, we have some removal. A removal is a little bit lighter in this deck than in some other decks because we are running so many counter spells. But we still got to get some removal. I mean, our opponents are going to land some stuff and we need to answer those. So we have Swords to Plowshares. It's Swords to Plowshares. Put it in all of your white decks. Next up, we have Anguished Unmaking and Vindicate. I love these cards. They both do very similar things. Anguished Unmaking is an instant. One of any white, black, exile target, non-land permanent, but you have to lose three life. That's still worth it. Still really, really good. And Vindicate just says destroy target permanent. So Vindicate can actually blow up lands, which is really sweet, but it's not an instant. And it doesn't exile. Still really, really good. Vindicate and uh, Anguished Unmaking, I think, go into any deck that has black and white. Next is Cyclonic Rift. I mean, come on. It's Cyclonic Rift. It's a commander staple. It, I don't know, man. It might deserve to be banned. I don't know. I'm not the one to talk about that, but while it's not banned, I'm putting it in all my blue decks. Next is Oblivion Stone. I like this particularly in this deck because we have some ways to search our artifacts. And, um, you know, that just lets us get Oblivion Stone if we really need it. So it's a three drop artifact. You can pay four and tap it and put a fate counter on a permanent, or you can pay five and tap it and sack it to destroy each non-land permanent without a fate counter, then remove all fate counters. So you can choose what it, you know, protects, or you can immediately just pop it and just blow up everything. Yeah, Oblivion Stone is super sweet. Next is Supreme Verdict. Yeah, can't be countered, destroy all creatures for one of any white, white, and blue. I mean, Supreme Verdict is excellent. If you can run it in your deck, you should probably just run it in your deck. Next is Fumigate. This one is a five drop, three white, white, destroy all creatures, then you gain one life for each creature destroyed this way. I like this a lot in controlling decks because, you know, people are gonna know what we're doing or, you know, maybe they don't know what we're doing, but they can suspect it. We're running send triplets. They probably suspect some shenanigans and uh, it can help us gain life back if the board is really, really big. And then finally we have Martyr's Bond. This is probably one of the newest inclusions in this deck. It is an enchantment for four of any, White, white, and it's kind of like Grave Pact, if you know what Grave Pact is. Whenever Martyr's Bond or another non-land permanent you control is put into a graveyard from the battlefield, each opponent sacrifices a permanent that shares a card type with it. Super, super sweet. It triggers off of itself. It can trigger off of, you know, the stuff that we steal because it says, you know, control rather than, you know, cards that you own. I like this card a lot, and I think it's probably underplayed. It, you should probably play it in more of your white decks. It's, it's that good. Next, we're talking card advantage, and you know, we're running a blue deck, we've got a lot of card advantage. First up is Jace Brin's Prodigy. This is uh, colloquially known as Baby Jace, or our Tiny Jace. It's a 0-2 legendary creature, human wizard for one of any and a blue. You can tap him and draw a card, then discard a card. If there are five or more cards in your graveyard, you exile him, and then he comes back flipped as a planeswalker. He turns into Jace, Telepath Unbound, is a five loyalty planeswalker. 
plus one up to one target creature gets minus two minus zero until your next turn that's eh, all right minus three this is where this is what we really want it for you may cast target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard this turn if that card would be put into a graveyard this turn exile it instead so it's kind of a nombo with rest in peace but you know lets us flashback stuff every single turn that's pretty good especially if we want to flashback i don't know one of our draw spells or you know any any number of sweet stuff he also has a minus nine of uh, you get an emblem with whenever you cast uh, a spell. Target opponent puts the top five cards of his or her library into his or her graveyard. I've literally never seen that happen, but uh, yeah, Jace is a really, really good value engine. If I can put him back in the sleeve. Next is Snapcaster Mage. You know, it's Snapcaster Mage. Human Wizard with Flash. It's a 2-1 for one of any and a blue. When it enters the battlefield, target instant or sorcery card in your graveyard gains flashback until end of turn. Flashback is equal to the converted mana cost. It's Snapcaster Mage. It goes very, very well in a controlling style deck. You know, get back your counter spells, get back your draw spells. And once again, it is a wizard and we have a card to get our wizards back to our hand. And so you can replay it. So yeah, you get some value off of that. Snapcaster Mage. I mean, it's Snapcaster Mage. Y'all know what it does already. Next is Thirst for Knowledge. And I also suppose Compulsive Research, though it's not as, sh not as shiny. There, wait, there we go. You can, you can see the shininess of the compulsive research so they're basically they're, they're kind of the same card so thirst for knowledge is an instant for two of any and a blue draw three cards then discard two cards unless you discard an artifact then compulsive research is a sorcery for two of any and a blue target player draws three cards and that player discards two cards unless he or she discards a land card so yeah um draw three cards and then discard two cards unless one of the stipulations is made I love these cards both. I think they're really, really good. And um, yeah, not much else to say. I like them. Next is Necropotence. This is an infamous card. I'm gonna go over it really quickly just in case you're newer and you don't know what it does. It is enchantment for triple black. Skip your draw step. If you would discard a card from your hand, remove that card from the game instead. Pay one life, remove the top card of your library from the game face down. At the end of your turn, put that card into your hand. And you know what you do? You pay like, I don't know, seven life, put a, you know, grip aside and then get it all in your hand. We have a lot of ways to, you know, play things at instant speed. On our turn, we're going to want to be playing a lot of our opponent's stuff from their hand anyway. So skipping our draw step, it really isn't that big of a deal. And, you know, you can just end up drawing a ton of cards with Necropotence. It's Necropotence. It's super, super good. Next is Esper Charm. This one is another sort of removal sort of draw. It costs Esper, so white, blue, black, instant. Choose one, destroy an enchantment, or draw two cards, or target player discards two cards. All of those modes are fantastic. If someone only has two cards in their hand, just like Esper charming them at instant speed and making them discard them is is pretty sweet. Um, or we can just draw some cards, or you can blow up a pesky enchantment. Yeah, Esper charm, really, really good. Next is Factor Fiction, another classic. It's Factor Fiction, put it in your decks. <laughs> if you don't know what it does, or maybe you're a new player, Three of any in a blue, instant, reveal the top five cards of your library. An opponent separates those into two piles. Put one into your hand and the other into the graveyard. I think this card is just a really fun card. You know, you get to pick an opponent and they have to, you know, make the decision to, you know, put what into what pile and then you get to pick that. There's a lot of interaction and fact of fiction is a, just a really sweet card. Next is Tamiyo the Moon Sage. So, you know, Planeswalkers are pretty versatile, but Tamiyo, she can draw us a lot of cards. So they have four loyalty Planeswalker Tamiyo for three of any double blue. Plus one tap a permanent. It doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. Minus two, draw a card for each tapped creature target player controls. You can draw a lot of cards because, you know, this is Commander. People will have a lot of creatures. And then she has an emblem with a minus eight. You get an emblem with you have no maximum hand size. And whenever a card is put into your graveyard from anywhere, you may return it to your hand. Yeah, I mean, that's insane. That's game winning if you can get up to minus eight. But, uh, you know, or you can just draw a ton of cards. Also drawing cards, you have Teferi, Hero of Dominaria. It's a five drop. Legendary Planeswalker Teferi, four starting loyalty, three of any, white, blue, plus one, draw a card. And at the beginning of the next end step, untap two lands. Yeah, super, super good for a control deck. Draw a card and then untap two lands. So, you know, you can play Counterspell on your opponent's turn. It also has a minus three of put target non-land permanent into its owner's library third from the top, which is pretty solid, you know, pretty versatile. You can put their, I don't know, Darksteel Forge into their deck. You can put their Avacyn, Angel of Hope, into their deck. 
Yeah, really solid. And then minus eight of, you get an emblem with, whenever you draw a card, exile target permanent and opponent controls. Yeah, that is a game-winning emblem. I mean, Teferi, he's a no-brainer. And then finally, we have Consecrated Sphinx. Another no-brainer, it's Consecrated Sphinx. If you're playing blue, you put it in your deck. Cost six, four of any double blue, flying, it's a four six. Whenever an opponent draws a card, you may draw two cards. You don't have to, but uh, you know, if you wanna draw two cards, go ahead and draw two cards. Next up, we have some ramp. Because we're playing commander, we're playing some ramp. We got Soul Ring. You know what Soul Ring does, it's Soul Ring. Next is Felwar Stone, and I want to point out that I am so glad I got the Quentin Hoover signature on this one. It is an artifact for two. You can tap it and add one mana to your mana pool of any color an opponent's land can produce. So this is really good with Sent Triplets. It lets us cast spells that our opponents can cast. So if they are running a red deck and we want to play red cards from their hand, Felwar Stone helps us play red cards if they have a red mana source. Next is Demir Signet, Azoria Signet, and Orzhov Signet. Yeah, they're Signets. You, you put them in your deck. Next is Chromatic Lantern, a must-have for this deck. Three drop, tap it, add one mana of any color to your mana pool, or lands you control have tap, add one mana of any color to your mana pool. Once again, helps us play cards from our opponent's hand, which is super sweet. Coalition Relic, very, very similar, three mana. Tap it, add one mana of any color to your mana pool, or you can tap it and put a charge counter on it, and then at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, remove all charge counters from Coalition Relic. Then you add one mana of any color to your mana pool for each charge counter removed. So if you don't need to use it this turn, you can tap it, charge it up, and then the next turn, it'll immediately add a mana, and then you can tap it for another mana. So you can kind of add two, which is pretty sweet. Next is Commander Sphere. This doesn't really help us cast our opponent stuff because it only adds mana of our commander's identity, which is fine. Or we can sack it and draw a card, which is also Pretty fine. Next is Tome of the Guild Pact. This is a five drop artifact. Whenever you cast a multicolored spell, draw a card, or you can tap it and add mana of any color. Yeah, pretty solid. You know, we're gonna be playing our opponent's stuff and people tend to run a lot of multicolored things in Commander. So you can actually draw a lot of cards from Tome of the Guild Pact. And then finally we have Smothering Tithe. Yep, it's Smothering Tithe. You put it in all your white decks. Um, but in just case you don't know what it does, it's an enchantment for three of any and a white. Wherever an opponent draws a card, that player may pay two. If that player doesn't, then you get to create a treasure, which is really sweet. A lot of people don't pay this, and the treasure adds mana of any color, which we need to cast our opponent's, you know, green and red spells, basically. So that's that for the main deck, blurry main deck in the background. Let's talk about our lands. I'm gonna go over these really quickly because a lot of them do very similar things, and you probably already know what they do. So, Mana Confluence adds one mana of any color, but we have to pay a life. Once again, for the same reasons that a lot of these other uh, ramp cards are good, adding one mana of any color is just really, really good for our deck. Same with City of Brass, almost the exact same thing as Mana Confluence. Forbidden Orchard does the same thing, adds one mana of any color, but we have to choose an opponent and they get a little 1-1 spirit, which we don't really care. They can have their 1-1 spirit. We're gonna play the, the really sweet stuff from their hands. Next is Lotus Field. This one has Hexproof. It enters tapped. When it enters the battlefield, we have to sacrifice two lands, but we can tap it and add three mana of any color, which is really, really sweet. I love Lotus Field a lot. It is quickly becoming one of my pet cards. I run it in a lot of decks, honestly. Next is Cascading Cataracts. This is a very interesting land. It has Indestructible. You can tap it and add one colorless mana to your mana pool, or you can pay five and tap it and add five mana in any combination of colors to your mana pool. Really weird and really sweet. I like Cascading Cataracts a lot. Next is Exotic Orchard. You can tap it and add to your mana pool one mana of any color that a land an opponent controls could produce. So it's basically like Felwar Stone. It just helps us play our opponent stuff, which is really, really good. What we want to do in this deck. Next we have Reflecting Pool. It's like the opposite of Exotic Orchard. It doesn't help us play our opponent's stuff if they're playing green or red, but it just says add one mana to your mana pool of a land you control could produce. Just helps us fix us for other stuff. And you know, maybe our opponents are playing some variation of Esper colors. Speaking of which, we have Arcane Sanctum. Enters tapped, add a blue, a white, or a black. Yep, Arcane Sanctum, put it in your deck. Next up, Command Tower. That's it, it's Command Tower. And we also have our uh, on-color fetches. I'm gonna go pretty quickly here. This is the lightning round. So we got all of our on-color fetches. We have all of our on-color shocks. We have 
all of our on-color scry lands, and I got to get the shiny in there because I did get the trouble of getting the uh, the scry lands foiled. We have our two on-color battle bond lands, which are excellent in commander. We have all of our on-color, uh, what are these, like, check lands? They're the lands that come into the play untapped if you control, you know, one of the, the types that they want. So, like, you know, plains or island for gl the Glacial Fortress, for example. Yeah, they're really, really good. Probably some of the best dual lands out there. Then we also have two of our on-color pain lands, Adarkar Wastes and Underground River. I mean, they're, they're pretty sweet, and we definitely want blue more than any of the other colors because we're pretty heavy blue. Nimbus Maze and River of Tears. These are like the Future Sight lands, I think. I think they're originally from Future Sight. They're pretty weird, but they, they do a good job of adding whatever mana that we need, albeit in different ways. I really like the Nimbus Maze. I think it's a really cool one. I'm not gonna go over it too much because it's pretty simple, but yeah, those are pretty good. Next we have Port Town with really, really cool art. I love this like ghostly figure in the middle of the, uh, the alleyway. This is one of the shadows over Innistrad lands. Yeah, it's it's all right. It's probably one of the lesser ones, but I still think it's worth an inclusion into the deck. And we're running heavy, heavy blue, so we definitely, you know, air towards the uh, blue duels. Next is Silent Clearing, as I mentioned, airing to, towards the blue duels. This is basically the um, Canopy land or Horizon land. I like calling these Horizon lands um, for our colors. The other colors have not yet been created as of the time of this filming. But, you know, it's really good. It lets you sack it and draw a card or, you know, or it's a pain land. I guess you can kind of include this with the, uh, the other pain lands. This is definitely better than a pain land. Next is Celestial Colonnade. This card is sweet. It enters the battlefield tapped. You can tap it for a blue or a white. Or you can pay three of any, a blue and a white. And then you turn it into a 4-4 white and blue elemental with flying and vigilance until end of turn. Kind of turn it into like a Sarah Angel. Yeah, it's really, really sweet. Next is Strip Mine. Yep, it's Strip Mine. Put it in your decks. It's, it's really, really good. Uh, this one is in French. Next is Riptide Laboratory. This is the card that I've been alluding to throughout this video. You can tap it for a colorless, or you can pay one of any and a blue and tap it and return target wizard you control to its owner's hand. So yeah, you can get back your Venser, or you can get back your Snapcaster Mage, or you can save your Baby Jace or whatever. Yeah, this card is really, really sweet and synergizes with some of the best cards in our deck. And then finally, we have an Island. An island, and an island, and then a swamp, and you can get maybe the foil in it, and a plains, and you know, we're running the Daughters of Esper, you gotta get the Esper foil basic lands if you're trying to pimp out a Centriplets deck. I'd also like to point out like the sky on here is just, it's just so cool looking, how the clouds have really flat bottoms and the sky has this grid. You can see the gridded sky from the, uh, the planes as well, you can kind of see it right here in the in the foiling. Yeah, it's it's so cool. I love the Esper lands. I really hope we go back to Alara because Esper is, is so cool. And there you guys have it. One of my four horsemen decks, my send triplets control combo question mark deck. I love this deck. It is so fun to pilot because it's it's really different every single time you play it. Because you can play stuff from our opponent's hand. So if they're playing, I don't know big green creatures, we can play their big green creatures. It's so fun. Or if the game is taking a million years, we can just combo out and just end the game so we can just get on with another commander game. You know, pick up maybe your other deck, play Liliana next, or play uh, Maelstrom Wander or something else. Center Blitz is definitely one of the decks I consider every single time I sit down to play commander. I love it that much. And I also wanted to say thank you guys so, so much for watching. Maybe leave a like, maybe leave a comment, Maybe leave a subscribe. Every little bit helps, and I appreciate it oh so very, very much. But regardless of what you do, thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you next time for some more Magic the Gathering content. I will see you then.